Now, I believe you were the one who that discovered Wicked, the book. So what led you to read the novel and, and decide that it was a story you wanted to dramatize? Um, well, as I say, sort of in a very random and casual way, I happened to be on a holiday in Hawaii I, on a snorkeling trip. And on the boat, on the way back from swimming around and looking at colorful fish, um, a friend of mine named Holly Neer, who's an American folk singer, um, mentioned in casual conversation, as one does, um, oh, I'm reading this really interesting book, and it's called Wicked. It's by some fellow named Gregory Maguire. And it's actually, it's the Oz story told from the Wicked Witch's point of view. And that was my first hearing about the book. And I just was seized immediately with one of those, you know, the light bulb goes on <laughs> epiphanies and thought, that's one of the best ideas I've ever heard, and it seems a perfect idea for me. It's so me in this character and where it's set and the whole idea of it and the philosophical idea of wickedness and goodness and um, the labels we put on people and you know all these sorts of things mm -hmm. appeal to me immediately and so the next day when um, I flew back to the mainland I called my lawyer and I said okay look there is a book called Wicked and it's been out for a while, so somebody has the rights. Mm -hmm. But I feel this is a project for me, and I'm going to go get the book, and I need you to find out who has the rights. And that's how the musical began. Cool. Now, many of the circumstances of the novel are changed in the musical, you know, including the fate of some of the characters and their journey. Mm -hmm. How involved were you in these choices of... Oh, completely. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, basically, the show is written by myself, and Winnie Holtzman, who wrote the what we call the book of the musical, and I, I need to distinguish that between the book, the novel Wicked, which was written by Gregory Maguire, and, and the whole idea, of course, was Gregory's, and then the dialogue section of the musical is referred to as the book. Um, but together, Winnie and I worked out the story, and there were some things that I felt strongly about including and changing, and some things she felt strongly about including and changing. When Gregory first encountered the show, which was at a reading, I guess it was maybe the fourth or fifth reading that we had done, mm -hmm. and I, I was so nervous about how he would respond because I thought, well, we've changed so much of his book, and I kind of nervously told him that before the reading. Um, but he was nothing but completely supportive. He was the first one on his feet at the end of that reading, and he just, he felt we had stayed true to the themes and the mm -hmm. underlying uh, content and the point of view and therefore if we change the focus a bit and change some of the specific story that was fine with him. Were you looking at a different audience that maybe he was writing for? No, we were actually looking to ourselves. Right. It really had nothing to do with the audience. It was what story do we want to tell um, in the same way that Gregory was inspired by the original Wizard of Oz and presumably the, the, the famous film of the Wizard of Oz. We were inspired by his work, but we didn't want to replicate his work exactly because there were, there were just things, that, there were issues that were more important to us than to him. I mean, I'll give you an example. In the novel Wicked, there are certain things where you find out how some of the famous totems and characters from the Wizard of Oz first came to be. You find out the, um, the, the, the source of the flying monkeys. You find out what those ruby slippers were about. You find out about who the cowardly lion was. But there are others you don't find out about. Right. And I, that was very important to me. Mm. Once I sort of saw that in the novel and I liked it so much, I thought, well, but I want to know about that black hat, and I want to know who that scarecrow was, and who's that tin man, and how did they come into this story? And so that became important to me to include uh, in, in the structure of it. And then Winnie had, had her things too. In Australia, there's not the practice of the out-of-town tryout right. um, before you know, the gala opening night. As a writer, what does your role usually entail, and was that very different for Wicked? No, it was, it was pretty, the, the development of Wicked really followed um, a kind of standard operating procedure in the States, uh, at least the, the way I like to work and I've worked in the past. Um, we did a lot of developmental stages over the, it usually takes about five years to do a musical from start to finish. Um, and so we spent, uh, after we'd sort of done the outlining process and 
getting a first act together process, which took maybe a year and a half or two. Um, then we started doing a series of readings, and over the course of, say, two and a half years, we did seven readings of the show, where we'd do a presentation um, just with actors and music stands, you know, no staging, no costumes or sets, and sort of hear the work and see how um, people were receiving it and what they were getting and what they weren't getting, and then we'd make changes, and when we sort of needed to learn more, we'd do another reading. As I said, we did seven of those, and then we reached the point where we felt we really couldn't learn any more about the show without doing a production and putting it in front of an audience, and then we did an out-of-town tryout in San Francisco. Um, and learned an enormous amount, needless to say, from that. And then um, the deal was that after that out-of-town tryout, regardless of what happened, um, we would shut down for about three months while Winnie and I reworked stuff and Joe thought about restaging and some stuff got redesigned. Just we, we could actually put into practice what we'd learned uh, from the, the out-of-town tryout. And that was very costly, as you can imagine. Shutting down for three months, I think, cost the producers about a million dollars. But ultimately, I think it was very, and they think, too, that it was very well spent because, you know, we fixed a lot of things that were wrong with the show. I've read you have a term called murdered darlings. Yeah, murder your darlings. It's not my term. I think it was Noel Coward. Oh, said. okay. Yes, it's one must you murder one's leaves. darlings. Yeah. <laughs> were um, there any? In oh, sure. There are always murdered darlings. There are always um, songs that you really like that have to go, and um, the moments that have to go. Uh, there was a there was a a slightly extended ending for Wicked, um, which was part of my original vision for the show that ultimately just didn't work on stage because uh, it, it just took too long to get there and sort of the story had, had wrapped up by then. But that was a big, big loss to me. And I'm hoping if and when there's a film version that because you can, you can change um, location so quickly in film and do things with voiceovers and song over, I, I'm really hoping we can put that part of the story back into the end of the film. And I believe Fierro's song was changed. Yeah, suggestion. and then I rewrote Fierro's song um, because the uh, the original, um, it wasn't working for the fellow who was playing Fierro. Actually, we had the Australian actor, Adam Garcia, who wound up playing Fierro in London. Yes. He did one of the readings for us, and I sort of wrote the song tailored to him, which worked amazingly well when Adam did it, but didn't really work very well for Norbert Leo Butz, who wound up playing the original Fierro. And also the audience misunderstood what the, the, the story point of the song was, and I, I felt I had to make it clearer what I was driving at. So rewrote it, just wrote a whole new song. Um, in the current theatre climate, with the popularity of jukebox musicals at the moment, there may be people reluctant to go to see a musical where they don't know the score to begin with. Um, how do you attract these theatre goers? Uh, that hasn't proven a problem to me. Um, I just, uh, and, and I think it hasn't proven a problem for other people who write, you know, shows that where the, the shows work and they have scores that people like. I mean, as as you probably know, the um, the soundtrack album for Wicked has been sort of astoundingly successful, um, and so people, you know, there's. I think there's always an interest in, in new music if, if it's something that people like. And you know, so listen, when jukebox musicals are good, or they really um, find a way to, to make that whole package work, then they do well. And when they're not so good, then they don't do well, just like any other show. Do you think it comes back to the, the book and the way they it's always the book. Yeah. It always, you know, it's always book, 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 book. That's, you know, it's funny as a composer lyricist who doesn't write book, um, but I'm the first one to say that's, that's what really counts. You know, I'm, I'm working on this opera now, as you may know, and even with opera, which you would think it's counterintuitive to say this, it's still the story. It still always comes down to the storytelling. Are you telling a story that people are interested in? that keeps them wanting to know what happens next, characters that they care about or find compelling, um, that they can either identify with or be appalled by or whatever, it always comes down to that.